to the Mad Max Minute. They're piling in the back seat. They're generating steam heat pulsating to the backbeat. It's Mad Max Fury Road, one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 42, the answer to life, the universe, and everything, which begins with Max on high alert as Furiosa and the wives board the war rig, and it ends with the war rig steadily picking up speed. I think one of the major things that we miss out on in the Mad Max series is that no one has a towel for traveling, which if you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's always good to have at least a towel for various reasons, including people looking at you and thinking that you've got your stuff together. (laughs) Well, I would argue that they actually do have a towel. There is a pile of extra fabric that is getting passed back and forth between different wives who are carrying at any given moment. Um, And with that pile of extra fabric, Toast makes a scarf and one of the other wives wears it like a shawl. So they do things with this extra fabric. And we see in this minute that they use part of that extra fabric to bandage up Ang Herod's leg. So, yeah, it's useful. It's useful, but it's not a towel. It doesn't work with my Hitchhiker's Guide reference. I think it does work with the reference. I think it does. We'll agree to disagree. One thing's for sure, there are no dolphins in this movie, because they've all left. Maybe that was really the problem. Maybe so. Maybe they took all the water with them. <laughs> Maybe that's where the ocean went. Maybe that is where the ocean went, finally. <laughs> Questions from season three finally answered 40 some odd minutes into season four. <laughs> Spectacular. So Furiosa climbing into the war rig, keeping her eyes on Max, moving very slowly and deliberately, because in this instance, sudden movements would only prove to provoke a very skittish Max. I think when we look at Furiosa, she's treating him like a cornered animal. I think that's a very fair analogy. He has been described in this movie by characters as feral. And he is being backed into a corner, literally being backed into the passenger seat of this truck where he does not want to be. So whatever dangerousness analogies you want to draw from that, I think are very appropriate. It does make me wonder how Steve Irwin would handle this situation. Now, obviously, Steve Irwin tragically passed away in 2006, so he wasn't around for any of this to make a cameo, which... Honestly, how amazing would a Steve Irwin cameo have been in a Mad Max movie? But I digress. <laughs> you can see Steve Irwin would probably do what Furiosa is doing, be very slow, letting her hands be seen at all times, being very respectful of the space that Max wishes to occupy, because the world is full of beautiful creatures that you have to respect. It's pretty good. That man was a treasure, and it was a tragic day when he died. Absolutely. I can agree with you there. Which is why it tickles me to no end that he was a voice in Happy Feet. (laughs) He was? Yeah, he played Trev. I don't know who that is. What kind of animal is he? (laughs) Probably one of the elephant seals. I don't know. Okay, I'm like, if if you tell me he's a freaking penguin, I'm going to kill you. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're right. It's probably one of the elephant seals because they were the Australians. Exactly. Honestly, I don't want to have to go back and check. No. Nope, 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 nope. So with Furiosa in the driver's seat, she swings the door shut, and as she does so, she shouts outside, let's go, and all of the wives shuffle up towards the rig. And as Furiosa settles into her seat, she pulls the file out from underneath the dashboard, and all I can say is, where did she get that? Where was that hiding? Does Uh it matter? Okay, well, one, you're right, it doesn't matter. (laughs) But the same argument can be made for anything we talk about in this movie. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. It's just a movie. But it matters to us. I'm a little disappointed that the file isn't attached to the handle in the door. I would have liked that. It was so perfectly placed in last minute that she could have climbed up into the truck, reached over, pulled it out, and then handed it to him. It would have been a beautiful piece of set dressing where something that we noticed ahead of time turned out to be the thing Mm -hmm. that would have been lovely as for where she actually does get it from i'm not really sure i mean obviously it's somewhere like low down do you think maybe she's got a toolkit oh i'm sure there are toolkits hidden all over well yeah Uh. of course there's toolkits all over the place in there but do you think she has a specific toolkit that she can reach while driving oh i'm sure of it i just have to wonder 
about the function of a file. I guess she's got enough experience working with the rig that a file is just a common piece of equipment. The thing about her pulling it out of underneath the seat, underneath the dash, that means that the file was always there, and there was a possibility that if Max got away, he would have found the file eventually. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that before. It's not like she had it on her person. Yeah, she it's... just knew where in the rig to find it, and Max would have picked that rig apart eventually. Eventually. Now, when Max acquiesced to her coercion <laughs> okay. of offering to get that thing off his face... I assume that Max assumed that Furiosa was going to use the bolt cutters on him. <laughs> yeah. And certainly the question still remains, why didn't she use the bolt cutters on him? It is a much faster method. And I mean, it's just a lock, like a padlock on the back of his head. So why didn't they use the bolt cutters? I like the idea of her presenting a solution, but because she has no interest in his comfort. She is offering that solution in the most difficult and time-consuming way possible. As if she's got a number of tools in that stash where the file was. Like, you've got a file. You've got a Dremel with a metal cutting wheel. You've got an angle grinder. You've got all of these things that can make the job faster, but she picks out the file because he's causing trouble, so he's got to work for the thing that he wants. Yes. That also will distract him for a time. Mm -hmm. Keep him busy. Keep him busy. Kind of like a puzzle or a crossword. Yeah. Like here, play with this Rubik's Cube for a while. <laughs> Certainly. And Max, he snatches that file up very hungrily, and he puts it right into the back of his mask. I'm assuming right by the padlock, because we don't see it just yet. And I think, let me scrub through this minute here. He places it in such a way that it stays put, but I don't know if we actually see... We do. A rear view. Second... Oh, a rear view? No. But in second 20, we do see it hands-free. Okay. It is stuck there in such a way that it has enough tension to stay. Yeah. Max probably has an idea of what the thinner part is between the padlock and the loop that the padlock is wrapped around. And whatever he puts it through, it's enough to keep it in place, and that's the important part. Yeah, I imagine he has felt his way around back there and pretty much knows the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. So with Max taken care of, we get to see the wives piling into the backseat. We've got Toast, we've got Capable, we've got Ang Herod, Cheeto, and the Dag. And what I like about this shot is that we get to see Capable putting positive pressure on the bullet wound that is causing trickles of blood to flow down Ang Herod's leg. Because Capable is... The capable one that has made it her mission to take care of Angherod. Yeah, maybe her life back in the harem with books and knowledge and culture available to her, maybe her interest tended more towards medical things. Possibly. Which could very well be her motivation for hanging out so closely to Angherod. It could be that within the harem, capable was the one working most closely with Miss Giddy or the organic mechanic or something like that with the intent of her one day becoming a word burger herself. A word burger? Yeah, that's what they call Miss Giddy and the history man in the comics. Because they're tattooed with words all over them, they call them word burgers. Okay, is that a play on hamburger? I don't know. I think okay. it's a play on human meat sort of thing. Oh! Like, you're not a human, you're just a piece of meat. Do you identify yourself as human negative? I'm a meat popsicle from the fifth element, that sort of thing. Okay, that's very dehumanizing, which I fit into saying. this world. That's, that's, yeah, that's how it goes here. Please excuse me while I hide my shock at the idea that someone involved in Joe's organization would be dehumanized in some way. Oh, yeah. But either way, Capable is trying to stop the bleeding because... I imagine blood is just as hard to get out of a car interior in the post-apocalypse as it is in the pre-apocalypse. Oh, certainly. They can't just stop by a detailing shop. You know, it occurs to me that we've never really paid attention to what the seats are made of. I think it's a leather. Yeah, which would make it an easy cleanup. That's a good point. That's a very good point. It's not like it's upholstery. It's leather. Yeah. Leather is nice and durable. You just wipe it up. I mean, if the blood was dried, you would still wish for some sort of moisture 
to clean it up with, which would be hard to come by. Yeah, I don't think there's a abundance of armor all wipes that they can just find somewhere. I just throw a little bit of mother's milk on there to like moisten up any dried blood and then wipe it off. That'll work. That'll absolutely work. It works for the, Max later in the movie. I know that much. But the point is, is that the blood wouldn't soak in and stain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Dag swings the door shut and Furiosa reaches down underneath the dash. I assume to start the switch sequence, but Max with a uh, <laughs> classic Rocky Balboa impression there. But he stops her and Furiosa looks up at him like, um, what did I do? And Max leans over, reaches underneath the dash, and pulls out a gun. And so my question is, was Furiosa actually going for the gun? Was she going for the switches? And most importantly, would Furiosa be fast enough to beat Max in a close quarter shootout? Do you think she would have been able to maneuver with that right arm to swing the gun out enough to shoot him? Okay, you asked a lot of questions. I did, in rapid succession. Well, for starters, I think she was going for the sequence. I do not think she was going for the gun. Second, Max's suspicion, he reached straight for it, like he knew it was there already, which I think is a product of how he treats his vehicles. He knows the place where you put guns. He knows if you're sitting in the driver's seat, this place, this spot is easily reachable. It could also be that he saw it when he was driving. Right, Why didn't he already clear out the cab of guns? Why wait until there are other people in there to clear out the cab? My guess is that he was so relieved to be inside of a vehicle again that he didn't think of it. Because he thought he was going to be alone. Right. He was operating under the understanding that he was home free. Making a getaway. Yeah. That he was going to have hours ahead of him of driving to his next destination. Priorities. Of course, that being said, Max is also the exact kind of person that will take oddball places in a vehicle and hide a weapon there. Because like the gyro captain said, Max is a quick fella who might have a weapon under there (laughs) and he would have to pin his head to the panel. Yeah, Max really has met his match in Furiosa. They're so similar and yet so different. Yeah. Honestly, it would never work. They have too much in common. Oh, no, no. I know this is going to be a dumb question, and of course the answer is going to be yes, but are there people out there on the internet that ship these two? Max and Furiosa? I hope not, but you know there are. Of course there are. There are always going to be people who do that. And I think that is all wrong, because they're more the same person. They're more the male and female version of the same person. Mm -hmm. I would ship Max and Auntie before I ship him with Furiosa. But that's mostly because of the promotional pictures that they put out for that movie (laughs) of Mel Gibson and Tina Turner, like, posing together. Yeah, the promotional material was aiming towards that. I suppose if I wanted to think about it, which I really don't, I would be much more inclined to ship Max with one of the wives. Like if it had to happen? Yeah, like if this movie had to have a romantic storyline, wouldn't it have been cruel to ship him with a Herod? Yeah. Yeah, that would have been cruel. Yeah, it would have. Thank goodness they didn't. No. I am very glad that they didn't have any sort of romantic subplot in this movie. Well, they kind of do. We haven't gotten there yet. Oh, that's Capable right. Capable and Nux. That's right. So there is some shipping going on in this movie. It's going to be a while before we encounter that. And it's I was so focused minor. on Max, I forgot about Nux. I know, right? <laughs> Max, Max is incapable of love (laughs) that's horrible no max is not incapable (laughs) he may not be capable yeah because capable is a separate person yeah you know maybe we need to choose a different word when we're talking about max about his ability to love yeah max doesn't have the ability to love because his heart was broken so long ago and he's closed himself off to the possibility yeah i just don't think it's possible for him max needs to go to the caribbean and get his groove back just like stella (sighs) you know i've never seen that movie but now as i'm getting older i feel like that movie will speak to me I feel like I need to go see that movie. Well, one reason to watch that movie is because it stars Angela, Angela Bassett. Angela Bassett. And the guy who is it helps guy? her get her groove back, I'm pretty sure is Tay Diggs. Yeah, I think so. 
I still want to see Angela Bassett play a rebooted Auntie Entity. That would be magnificent. Anything with Angela Bassett. Yeah. <laughs> As someone who is getting older, I feel like I need to see that movie now. When did it come out? It came out in 1998. Yeah, see, in 1998, I was 17. I did not need a movie like that, and a movie like that didn't speak to me. It didn't call out to me in any way, but now that I am 37, I'm ready for a movie like that. So you were so focused on getting your groove in the first place that you were not interested in seeing another woman get that groove back. Right, right. You're like, show me how to get that groove the initially. first time. I will watch that movie. <laughs> Speaking of movies, we should probably get back into the one we're actually talking about. Oh, that's right. We're watching a movie. So Max puts the gun on the seat next to him, and Furiosa starts reaching around and flipping these switches. And we should be very focused on what she's doing here, because it looks like the switch that she has her hand on in 26, she flips that one twice, she moves on to a third switch, hits that one once, and then reaches over her lap, flips up the red covering, hits that switch, and then we cut away to Nux. So as far as we know, there are at least four steps to this process, and we will find out later on how many more steps there are. But at least we know two on the middle, one on the end, red switch, at the very least. So out on the sand, Nux is starting to stir. He's slowly recovering from that hit that Max gave him, and as he sits up, he watches the war rig rolling away, and Nux finds himself at a decision point. He looks behind, he sees the war party, and he hops up off the ground and starts off running after the rig. Yeah, he has a choice to make. He could wait there for the war party to come collect him with a certain amount of shame because he was bested, mm -hmm. or he could continue to risk his life I say that like it's a negative. He sees that as a positive. Yeah. And go after the rig. And actually, when you think of it from his point of view, like I could go back to the war party empty handed. Or I can claim glory. Or I can still have an opportunity to die glorious. Yeah. Gee, which one am I going to do? Yeah. This is a no brainer for him. Because he knows that if he pulls it off, that he can ask for whatever he wants. And he wants to drive that war rig. So he's going to go after this opportunity. And as we get back into the rig, that's where Toast pipes up for the first time. And she says, of all the legs you had to shoot, that one was attached to his favorite. Yeah, saying Toast pipes up to say this line, that's a stretch. Because her lips are a teeny tiny bit moving, but not enough to actually be speaking. There's no way she's actually saying this line in this moment. Well, this movie does love ADR. It really does. It looks like she's practicing her line to herself. <laughs> okay. And they just chose that take. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. The main thing I want to point out here is that it's the first time we hear Toast, and so it is the perfect time to talk about Zoe Kravitz, who is playing Toast the Knowing. And her top four on IMDb include this movie. She was also in X-Men First Class in 2011. She played Angel Salvador, the woman with the bug wings that could fly around. She was in 2014's Divergent, where she played Christina. And she was in 2013's After Earth, where she played Will Smith's wife and Jaden Smith's mom as Senshi Rage. She was not on the planet with those characters. I think she featured mostly in flashbacks and communications. But anyway, Zoe Kravitz was born December 1st, 1988 in Los Angeles, California. She is the daughter of musician Lenny Kravitz and actress Lisa Bonet. The two of them were married the year before Zoe was born, but they divorced in 1993 when Zoe was only five years old. She stayed with Lisa Bonet until age 11 when she moved to live with her father in Miami, though she still spent summers with her mother. She attended school in Miami before transferring to New York, where she got her high school diploma in 2007. Kravitz began acting while still in high school, landing a role as a babysitter in the 2007 Catherine Zeta-Jones rom-com No Reservations, before landing roles in several other projects over the next few years. Parallel to her acting career, Kravitz modeled for magazines and ad campaigns, as well as singing for two different bands that she started, the first being Elevator Fight in 2009 and Lola Wolf in 2013. 
In 2011, Kravitz's acting career began to pick up speed with her appearance in X-Men First Class, which makes her the third X-Men alum that we've talked about, and an eight-episode run on the television show Californication. Other notable roles for her include her voice acting in the Lego Batman movie and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, as well as cameos in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them as Lita Strange and her role as Christina in the Divergent series. Her character in Fantastic Beasts. It's hard for me to, like, classify her character because I didn't like the movie. Okay. But she gives off a lot of mixed vibes throughout the movie, and then she sacrifices herself in the end. And I think she was the right actress to put in that part because I see a lot of mixed vibes coming from her here. I think she plays that well. I think she does good blank face. And especially here in this scene where she says, of all the legs you had to hurt, you hurt the one attached to his favorite. She's really indifferent when she says it. Like, she is saying these words of warning to Max. At the same time, she doesn't care. Yeah. Well, we'll see instances later on in this movie of how Toast and Ang Herod interact. Yes. I think this is our first little glimpse into their relationship. Yeah. I mentioned on Monday the idea of them representing the Furies and one of the Furies name meant jealousy and Mm. i think that might be a little bit of what's going on with toast fun facts about zoe kravitz lisa bonet remarried in 2017 to jason momoa and zoe has two step siblings a younger half sister named lola and a half brother named wolf which is where the band name lola wolf comes from zoe kravitz also has two godmothers cree summer and marissa tomei and her godfather is movie producer bruce cohen getting back into the minute Max doesn't have any responding comment to what Toast is saying. He just keeps his gun pointed towards the back seat, and he actually lets it drift over to Furiosa as she shifts the war rig and gets them started up so that they can leave. And we end the minute with the war rig driving across the frame in a very Wes Anderson-y way. Static camera, moving subject, very evenly set tableau there. It's another typically, you know, gorgeous laid out shot. Mm That phrasing is horrible, but... That's all right. English is hard. Yes, it is. But that shot brings us to the end of this week, and I think it's a great note to end on. Just that image of the war rig on its own driving away. What stands out to me as a bit odd, though... Are you looking at the final moments of this minute by any chance? I am. I am. Look at the windows of the war rig. What do you notice about them? There's nobody in the back seat. Yeah. You can see a single head in the front seat, probably in the driver's seat, but it doesn't look like there's two people in the front and there's nobody in the back. Ah, see, they thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. But we did. (laughs) I love it. Just (laughs) getting a final dig here at the end of the week. So come back on Monday. (laughs) Nux is going to catch up to the war rig. Max is going to find a better way to stow the weapons he's collecting. And the wives are going to get chatty. The Mad Max Minute Podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. The Mad Max franchise was created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy, is presented by Kennedy Miller Mitchell Productions, and distributed by Warner Brothers. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute, like us on Facebook by searching for Mad Max Minute, and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com, where you can see what's in our Tee Public store, join our Patreon, or even donate to the show to help us keep the tanks full. Thank you for joining us for Minute 42 of Fury Road. We'll see you next time.